All right, welcome to the grand final. We are here with the Finland Raiders and the Geilen Banger. It's party time. We have a best of five in our hands. This is Heroes Lounge Division 1 end of season. And we have our grand final. So let's introduce the boys first and then we're going to go into some of the details here. We have Banana H on the left in blue. On Genji, Uki is playing Diablo. We get Gavlo on Junkrat. We have Sven playing Blaze. Hunter on Brightwing. And on the right side of the map in red, it's Ultralisk on Imperius, X-Ray on Rega, Hazops and Sylvanas, Death Knight on Murden, and Darkmog is playing Sonya for the Germans. Alright, so let's get this party started and see which team takes the lead here. Again, a best of five series, there's no loser bracket, this is the grand final. So this is what decides who is going to be the champion of the season in Heroes Lounge. Also, quick notes, if you're watching this on YouTube, I know this video is coming a little bit late. Reason is actually quite simple. I got sick immediately after coming back from uh, Gamescom from Germany, where I hosted some panels for Asus. It was a lot of fun. It was really enjoyable. They did a fantastic job there, and it was just awesome to talk to some of the people there on stage. Yeah, but immediately after I came back, I got sick for a couple of days, and all the plans of what I wanted to do once I came back in regards to casting obviously went out the window so yep here we are a little bit late but we're still covering all of this and Dark Walk at the top is also getting covered by two and nearly dies as a result of it down to the bottom of the map though it's Death Knight who is in trouble so a couple of gank squads are roaming the map and yeah, that's the end of Muradin the dwarf is dead he thought he could escape jumps over and right into the hands of Diablo Lord of Terror just murdering him over here so yes, awesome stuff. Yeah, besides the good stuff in Germany, there was also some uh, some nuisance. I rented a car for the trip, and as it turns out, once I gave the car back at the airport and was ready to fly back to Valencia, the guy all of a sudden is like, did you see that scratch? And I'm like, scratch? What the hell are you talking about? So apparently somebody, must be like a cyclist or whatnot, uh, pedestrian cyclist, I have no idea. I don't, didn't look like a car. Hit me while I was parked and I didn't notice it the entire time and it was fairly interesting because well that is probably gonna cost me up to a thousand bucks which is pretty much self coverage that I had there so yeah kinda wild generally speaking there were a couple of wild stories like so many douchebags on the highways these days it was just mind-blowing I was just it was incredible I think my favorite was one guy that literally tried to pick a fight with me. I might have told the story already, like I don't know, but I'm going to repeat it because it was just absolutely bonkers. So that guy literally blocked me on the highway every single time that I was trying to get past him on a three-lane road. And he already acted like a dick to other people before, and I was just trying to get away from him. I was like, okay, let's not get boggled up with that asshole. And then the first thing that happens is he literally blocks me on my attempt to overtake him several times, then writes parallel to me, tries to provoke me to no end, and the whole thing really continues until I, at some point, whip out my phone and start recording him on a video and show it to him, and he immediately started backing off. But I was just like... What kind of people are driving on these highways these days? I mean, honestly, that could have resulted... That guy was just, like, begging for an accident at 150 kilometers per hour. Ridiculous. So, yeah. So, yeah, that part was definitely a bit wild. The scratch thing with the rental car, I honestly think it might... Either it happened while I was parked, or it was already there and I didn't see it when I walked around the car. Lesson learned, next time I go there, I have to definitely take a video of the car before and just walk around it, but still a little bit annoying. Not quite as annoying as what is happening here from the perspective of the blue team as they're getting pinned down in their own base a bit and Genji nearly was murdered because of that, but still annoying. Now, to be fair, blue team is still in the lead, so I think they can deal with that nuisance and they're working on a third kill and they get it. They take Sylvanas down, so that's three kills to zero now. And we have a lead in experience and talents also for the Raiders. They're off to a really good start, I gotta say. I mean, this is absolutely awesome, I gotta admit, because heading into the grand final, I had the uh, Geilen Benga pegged as the favorite, and I really expected them to come in strong with maybe a decisive victory even on the first map, but uh, definitely for the series, but apparently we're in for much more of a fight than I expected, because currently it's exactly the opposite of what I thought would happen. It's the Raiders that are just showing off 
getting three kills already, running a one level lead and doing a stellar job here. Now, noteworthy that Hazorps, of course, is running Sylvana, so if at any point they get momentum, they could negate that advantage again. But for now, the blue team is definitely running the show here and calling the shots. And I like it, I'm all here for it. Level 7, the Dirty Trickster. For Junkrat, we got at the same time the Holy Fervor now, with the Grounded Totem in. Uki, careful with Diablo there at the front, yes, and exactly for that reason. So he dies to Imperius. They were hoping that maybe for a counter killer, but couldn't get it. Top side, that's when we now have still our 1v1 situation between Sven and Darkmog. Uh, Sven pushing this one out, Darkmog doing his best. Uki, in the meantime, is traveling towards the next seat and towards the top lane, trying to put some additional pressure onto Sonya. Currently, we have one seat only. <laughs> Darkmog <laughs> gets burned down after Brightwing came in to help out too. So, four kills to one. Still a very good situation for the Raiders. They're gonna lock in a second seed, that one's a given. And with level 10 in their grasp, they will also have an advantage that they can use to maybe take some of the camps away, maybe push a lane a little bit. But either way, things are going quite smoothly for the team in blue. So the Raiders, definitely in a good mood. The guy and Banger are probably waiting for level 10. Dynamics obviously changed there quite a bit after you access your heroic abilities and can also set up some uh, synergies around them. So that's what they are waiting for here. We have the camps claimed and therefore no aggressive invade with level 10 in that small window that existed for the raiders. But by now the guy and Banger also with their own heroic abilities. We're getting no leap in this case. Nope. It's full on Wrath of the Berserker here for Dark Mox. So he is looking for the sustain with Imperius with Murden, that triple front line is pretty beefy and it's gonna help them out quite a bit to sustain themselves through fights, or at least it should. But here comes the next battle, and here comes Diablo with a barbecue and the lightning breath. Kill number five, Imperius is gone. And this is a pretty shitty spot for the guy in Banger because, as is, we're now looking at the third, the third seat on the map. I was about to say tribute again. And that's a big opportunity. Not only do they have a nice camp and minion wave running through the bottom of the map trying to break this down, but they also can now go for the first garden terrors of this game. Sylvanas under attack, so is Rega, and he's the one that gets bounced around. But the Ancestral is there. This well, this time in time to save X-Ray. But the seed is still there. Now the good news is that they have their fifth back on the map. So they didn't have to give up the seed just yet. Half a level lead only. So the red team is doing a decent job trying to get back into experience range. Nice! Done against Darkmok though. And he might have overreached here a little bit. The rip tire takes him down. And that is another 5v4 situation in favor of the Raiders. And they still have Blaze up at the top. Sylvanas dies at the bottom of the map too. So they're winning a 5 versus 4 essentially. Rega's trying to get the seed. He gets interrupted too. Blaze is finally moving back down, but he already proxied so many waves topside that level 13 is now going to be ready for them, which was the plan all along, of course. Get that lead in experience, then force the fight. But essentially, he also applied more and more pressure onto the top fort, which is now guaranteed to fall with those Garden Terrors. And you can see that the same is likely going to happen in the middle, down at the bottom of the map too. Nicely done. The Raiders, therefore, Likely to take the entire outer ring of defense and claim it, and they're looking for even more kills. I mean, they're having a party here. They're having a great time. They're coming in with seven kills to one, a talent advantage, and a one and a half level lead as they're destroying one structure after another. The bottom fort has already fallen. Rega was trying to defend the top, but even there, they didn't stand a chance. And now in the middle and down at the bottom of the map, they're going essentially for the same play here. So yes, Blaze is going to make sure that this fort falls too, even if it's going to be a bit delayed. Hazops was not able to save it. And down at the bottom of the map, the Garden Terrors already starting to break through the game and wall yeah. <laughs> starting to but yeah that hit point bar is a bit of a meme now either way fights not over yet and for some reason the red team thinks that they should battle this one out without a level 13 talent now 30 is not quite the same boost as would have been the case with level 16 but it's still pretty significant rip tire to blast the minion wave apart lets this walk through we have again the camp taken this time stolen away and this is just looking great. 
Honestly, if you start into a best of five series like this, this is spectacular. If they can hold on to this and snowball it, great. Now, the red team is going to try and prevent this from happening. They're still looking for that one team fight where they can finally claim a few lives and then get back into experience range, have the same talent as they currently do, and then snowball it a bit themselves with Sylvanas in their hands. And they've done that in the past, so it's not like it would be the first time. They've already had some really fantastic games with Hazops and Sylvanas that they played in the previous rounds. But there's again that kill against Rhaegar, so they get just caught on the map. And this is happening over and over again, and this fight is not over yet. So they're still looking to see if they can get control of another one. And they're moving straight in for Imperius. Genji is on him immediately, an Ultralisk. He just doesn't stand a prayer. He goes down. That's now 9 kills, 2-1, and nearly level 16. So the Raiders, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely crushing it in game number one. It's honestly impressive what they're showing off here currently. We have 35,000 damage for Genji. We're looking at 25,000 for Sylvanas. Desperate attempt at a defense, but that's a two-level disadvantage that we're now talking about for the guy in Banger. So they're a bit slow to wake up for this series, as it seems. And with that big of a lead now, two levels and one talent, there's no doubt that the Raiders are going to walk away with pretty much every single mercenary camp that, they're that they set their eyes upon. There's nobody to stop them in that attempt. So up at the top, they can now push with catapults. They have mercenary camps here that they can use as well. And they're going to try and break through this. Currently, it's looking... Yeah, I mean, extremely good. Sylvanas was at the bottom of the map the entire time and still is. Now she's heading back because she's needed for defense, but the idea was to try and get them slowly and steadily towards level 16. Of course, there's still a way to go. And before Azops is there, they kill on Sonya up and they're looking for a second one and they get it on Rhaegar, who got the Ancestral out to save Ultralis but lost his life. That's only three survivors at the top and it seems like Imperius, well, first of all, Murder might not make it. Murder and Imperius are both low and barely escaped this. The keep cannot run, so it is just taking one hit after another right now. And while all of this happens, in the middle of the map, there's siege giants that are also starting to attack another keep. Sylvanas trying to stop the bleeding here, but that is not gonna happen anytime soon. Hazorbs does not get the kill, and the blue team could now rotate over towards the middle and try and take another one out. They're deciding to play it a little bit safer, play it a little bit slow. There's still a slight battle between Ultralisk and Banana H here topside, but Genji is easily moving away with his uh, mobility. So, another channel, another seed, and that's the fourth one in a row that the Raiders decided in their favor. So yeah, job well done. Really well done here. Now, as I said, we have a few more camps up, and Blaze is taking the one at the top. Sven getting busy here. As the red team, they have to pretty much just go for the consolation prize, which is the bottom right siege giant camp. Another bruiser camp is about to be claimed by the raiders. And this is literally the last camp on the map, so obviously they're already looking at it and walking over there. But that also means that Mirrodin gets immediately attacked, CC'd, and needs to head out. But they're looking for a fight. They have 16 versus 16. They're cruising for another bruise, and they're coming in here. Banana H is about to move back out. Death Knight is very low. Needs to be extremely careful. Pops Avatar, and Rhaegar is in trouble on the right side. They're all low. Sven too, but the red team is in real trouble especially since they're losing their support once again. So no sustain left for the Geilen Banger. And they're losing Ultralis. They're losing Death Knight. Muradin is gone. That's a triple kill. Make it a quad kill. Yes, at least Blaze is gone. But the entire team has been wiped off the map. Full five-man team wipe as the Geilen Banger are just gone. And now we have in the middle a push for another keep. And this is, of course, going to focus on to the core it itself and this is going to be it game number one in this best of five series here the grand final is taken by the raiders the guile and banger not awake for the start of the series yet as it seems and if they want to have a chance to turn this around then they definitely have to step it up because at least on the first map the raiders made all the decisions made all the plays and had a spectacular performance nicely done they ended 13 minutes in with 16 kills to two well deserved victory gg well played
Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Okay, game number two. The Raiders are in the lead and we are now on all direct pass. We have an Uberak in the lineup, which means a bit of uh, cheesing around the prisons can also happen. So, around the prisoner camp. But, well, again, let's see what the guy in Benga can do now if they woke up after game number one because the Raiders so far had quite the showing. On the left, we have them with Hunt Dog on Brightwing for game number two. Uki on an Uberak. Banana H is playing Tracer. Gavlo on Junkrat. And Sven is a rock. Samoro, which is always awesome. Towards the right, the team from Germany, Hazobs with Hanzo, X-Ray on Rega, Dartmog on Hogger, we get Ultralisk on Genji and Death Knight, again on Murden. Game number one definitely didn't go the way the German expected. I mean, they did not only lose, they were pretty much crushed. That game, they had never any control over it. From start to finish, it was the blue team that called the shots there. And of course, they would love to continue that play. Now, X-Ray finds himself again on Rega. And we'll see if this is going to be a bit more successful for him here. On level 1, we already get Way of the Wind for Samuro. We got the Tracer rounds for Tracer as her first talent. Again, Anubarak, of course, he can later on go onto those prisoner camps and start to cheese them a little bit. But this is obviously well known also to the red team, so you can expect that once the objective is up and he becomes a threat in that regard, they're going to have somebody in the vicinity just to make sure that he doesn't get that channel. And in case that you have never heard of this, it's pretty much simple. So he can... Zimuru can do the same at the end of the day. You pretty much move in with either one. Ooh, nice. Only kill again for the Raiders. So you move towards the prisoner camp with either one of the two. You uh, get either a few beetles or copies out that occupy the grunts that protect the camp. And then you just channel while that happens and get a sweet little advantage that your opponent will have to make up for it. And talking about advantages. Damn. Ray got dead as well? Wow. All right. Ultralisk wants to get the kill and can't. Uh, but okay. He at least gets out. Well, Sven might have overplayed his hand a bit. <laughs> I mean, Sven, that was... I don't think he was too happy about that. First he gets out, plays it really nicely, and jukes out Genji a little bit just to tap the fountain, think, oh my god, my hit point pool is full again. And then all of a sudden realizing, well, wait a moment, my actual hit points haven't really caught up yet, so yeah, I'm just gonna die here. So, that was a bit of a meme moment. Ultralist taking the opportunity to get the kill. That one was highly unnecessary from Samuro. He was already safe and then committed honorable Sudoku, pretty much. So, yeah, kind of outplayed himself. But either way, great start for the Raiders. Now, Samuro has traveled to the top instead. One with the wind is in. And here we have a nice little skirmish down to the bottom of the map between the lanes as the rest of the team is coming through. Four versus four for the time being. And the prisoner camps are also now going to be located up at the top. So Samuro and Anupara could both make plays depending on how exactly they try and play this one out. First tower goes down at the bottom of the map. So at least some pressure from the red team. We got the Pulse Generator on level 4 now. We also got the Explosive Arrows and Target Practice for Hanzo. So no quick, easy boss takes later at the 5 minute mark. But he has exactly that kind of play. So the channel is already happening. Samuro is the one that takes care of it. As explained, he and Anubra can both do that little play. And all that they got to do here is get a bit of an advantage. That's three, six seconds that they got on objective number one that they didn't have to fight for, but they didn't have to invest anything. So uh, if you can make plays like that, absolutely fantastic. You can have Samuro do it later once again. You can have an Uberak sneak in, try and do the same thing. And if you just make that play a couple of times, then you will run a serious advantage over the opponent's team and can push or maybe even take the objective for free. So, level 7 kicking in right now. Muradin is the one that is now guarding the prisoner camp and he intercepts Nubarak as he was trying to make a little move there. 
Stuns are, of course, always coming out to guard this. Never outmatched here still for Hanzo as a level 7 talent. But the teams are now starting to become more aggressive around the two prisoner camps. Usually it's between level 7 and level 10 when the teams are starting to pay some attention to them. So it's an objective to get started fairly late in the game. But as I said, with Samuro and Nuburak on the side of the Raiders, they are the ones who have a chance to uh, get a bit more aggressive on this than usual. Nice! Great play here by Gavlo, booping Hanzo into a mine and then taking him out. That was well played down there, never giving him the chance to actually jump out. So they had Anubara come in and uh, get a stun through too, but that was well coordinated from the blue team. So they get another kill, kill number three. And yeah, they also lost a few seconds on their own camp, so that was nicely done by the guy in Banger. Once again, it's another attempt to keep those grunts occupied. But Genji is moving in with another interrupt, and as the rest of the team is also starting to circle around, they can't really go for uh, a few more seconds on this. Now, obviously, Hogger already on the camp once again. The same is happening with Junkrat on the left side. Both of these camps taken whenever they come off cooldown, as they should. Another set of quick hits is coming here. Banana H, careful. Get some assist from Brightwing. Death Knight was ready with Muradin to get a stun connected. There's a lot of tools that can be used as the game continues for the blue team in particular to just play a global card. And a big map like this, like Alderac Pass, that is worth quite a lot. You got Samoro, you got Brightwing, so you can play around the two of them to put extra pressure onto lanes to safeguard a lane if you're losing a fort or a keep there and have to deal with catapults. But we are now five minutes in. Have level 10. Oh, and we get... Oh, Glorong, is it you? Bladestorm. Okay, Bladestorm for... Oh, Tracer. And she's alive. Yeah, so Samuro gets Bladestorm. A little bit easier for him to take minion waves down. And we'll see how well he can use that. Loses, of course, some of the global mobility that he would otherwise have with this. But in addition to that, Tracer surviving that little attack. 10 now on both sides. Objective has been stopped for 5 seconds before the Raiders could have grabbed the cavalry here. Arrow! Nice! Stun chain against the Nubarak. And he's gone. Dartmok the one to put the final hit in. Nicely done, I gotta say. They nearly escaped with him. Hansog, yeah, doesn't get quite Hansog. Hansog is doing his best to get those arrows connected, but couldn't do enough damage. Tracer, though, she goes down. And that's three kills to three. Finally, some action from the guy in Banger. They're finally putting some plays in here and doing work. Job well done. So, now maybe even with the objective, if they can install it for long enough. And it looks like they will be able to. There's nobody trying to interrupt them. Down here, the wall has been completely destroyed. Up towards the top, it is indeed gonna be the red team that takes the first objective. Nice! They're getting the Raiders, I like it. So they're fighting back and they made it happen. There's still one camp that can be claimed. Both teams are going for it at the same time, so nobody's missing out on this one. But let's see how well they can do on the defense now. No Sylvanas this time for Azorb, so he doesn't have the chance to go for full structural damage with this, but Hanzo is still more than enough to pet the damage stats a bit. They got both of the Shimadas, 18,000 for Ultralisk, who is constantly nibbling at the hit point pools of the blue team, and 10,000 for Hanzo, who is leading the charts currently on the red team in regards to siege damage. Fighting it out with Hogger there, who is now taking over. But this is really where you're trying to get some extra damage in. Dartmok at the top, a bit low against Tracer though, but he's able to survive. Banana H therefore doing a decent job on this. Down to the bottom of the map though, Sven gets an assist as Ultralisk nearly got another kill in against Samuro. So Ultralisk has to move back here, and Sven is already defending with a Bladestorm. And as all of this happens and plays out, we have in the middle another attack happening. But the defense is just generally good. I mean, none of those forts has been destroyed, and it seems now, yep, that is the end of Hogger. Holy rectal, baby. <laughs> Banana Age giving that one an extra kick. And that's another kill for the blue team. So not only do they defend all of their forts, but they also get another kill. I like it. Nicely done. Job well done by them. Down to the bottom of the map. Sven is already moving back out. They're double checking on the boss too now. 
could definitely start making a play for that. Four kills to three, both teams on level 13. And in talents, that means that we are now also getting Shukuchi for Samuro. But the red team has indeed started to sneak in down at the bottom of the map, which was checked a few seconds ago by their opponents. So now they're going for the boss here. And, well, the Raiders haven't really sniffed that out yet. So they're moving in now, but it's all... Oh, is it too late? It should be too late. And Ubarak is not going to die for... He is diving for it. Um, okay, Brightwing is there. That's two of them against three. They used Cocoon too. And now they got to move back. The rest of the rotation is just not quick enough. It is... The Nuburak that nearly dies, but he gets out. The boss is already taken. Samuro is at the top, so they're buying some time for their side laner to get structural damage connected to. But of course, this is likely going to be the bottom fort as the guy and Banger are now moving in to take this one down. And I don't think that they are going to be satisfied with taking the fort. They're probably trying to take the wall at the bottom keep too. Samura at the top has a lot of time and wiggle room to uh, apply damage here and try and trade evenly with them. But by now, Hogger has at least appeared. This should still fall and does. But while the boss is moving in for the gate, we now have in the middle another attempt by the guy in Banger to do even more structural damage. So it's a pretty interesting second game that is unfolding currently in front of us. Lots of back and forth action between the two teams. And especially that move towards the boss, unbeknownst to the Raiders, paid off very well for them. Now Muradin, he wants his cooldown back. <laughs> As he gets interrupted, that's likely also going to be the end of him. Killed by Bladestorm and Brightwing. Genji is also dead. Taken out by Tracer in the mid lane. And with a Riptire move against X-Ray, it costs Rega his life. A triple kill against the Guile and Banger. So the Raiders again in the lead, nearly by an entire level. They will claim the early 16. That's of course a lot of experience readily picked up at the bot lane too that they can now claim here. It's looking fairly interesting, honestly. I mean, imagine a 2-0 lead for the Raiders in this series. They might walk away with a full 3-0 wipe in the grand final if they can accomplish that. One of the reasons why Hazops and his boys are now fighting back as much as they can. But since we already have Epic Center and the harsh winds here, we got the Ricochet. So there is a significant advantage with level 16 now for the Raiders. And it would be shocking if they couldn't get a big, big lead now on that objective. Can they lock the entire thing in? That's a different question, considering that the blue team, sorry, that the red team is about to get their own level 16 talents. But the advantage is there. Brightwing pushed out the bottle at the top lane a little bit more, trying to get, of course, some cut up pulls into a good position there too. But down here, 10 seconds are left before the cavalry would enter the game. Now they are stopping it for the time being. But it's still 16 versus 16 talents with a level advantage for the red team, as a blue team. And up at the top, that push is still coming through. That is likely also going to be experience lost for the red team, so another potential problem for them. They're trying to fight this once again out on the objective, trying to claim this one. Arrow! And the hit against Muradin! And he survives a double kill with Hanzo dropping Brightwing and Tracer. Every time we're seeing these objective fights, it's the guy and Benga who are all of a sudden making their big play. Not only did they save Muradin, but then they got three kills in a row. Hanzo Ops is murdering the blue team in these battles. He got a double kill in against Brightwing and Junkrat, and then was the one to also blow Tracer apart. I mean, it's honestly dirty. The old man is showing the youngsters how it's done. Hazorb's an absolute beast here in game number two and keeping them in play. But it's a bit ridiculous. I mean, they're falling behind over and over again. And then it's a fight over the objective where they're just claiming one kill after another, which not only brings them back, but also allows them to take the objective itself. So, Hoga, he's already taken the top. Hazorb's gets another kill. Top side, yep, they're getting the experience, they're pushing the lanes back out, and all of this is happening just as the objective is claimed, and they are getting another round of Raiders. Tracer, back to business, trying to do a thing, but Banana H was nearly deleted there. Azop's only problem is that he's running out of mana, so that's literally the only problem. Seven kills to seven at this point. 
And just looking at the damage output of Hanzo, he's still behind Genji at 31,000. So Ultralisk, with all the poke that he brings to the table, is doing a better job for now in pure numbers. But the kills, are, of course, it's a total different story. Hoga at the top with the Raiders is doing damage to the last remaining four. That one doesn't stand a chance. And everybody else is focusing onto the mid lane where they're hoping to take the keep out. So far that hasn't happened. Ancestral to keep Muradin, to keep X-Ray alive. Yeah, then he's gone. So Rega is down. Muradin also in a bit of trouble but should be able to escape. He has still enough hit points. They have to defend against all of these Raiders. And particularly in the mid lane, the idea is to still keep that keep in play. But they are barely able to do that. And the push isn't over yet. Slightly leading experience now for the red team, but they will have to back off eventually. Nicely though, the, nicely done by Ultralist though at the bottom of the map, he is able to take the keep out. So one keep indeed lost to the Raiders, meaning the first armor shield is gone on the core. And of course, another kill as Samuro is being hit again. Now they got the numbers advantage on the map in half a minute. That's on 20 seconds, that's when Rega is back to business. But they're already working on the bottom boss. And that might be them taking a bit too much of a risk. There's a little bit of a Hail Mary play here, potentially also for the blue team, as they could make a move for the boss. But I think it's about to get leashed, and yeah, not able to do anything about that. Hanzo gets killed though, so the biggest threat to them is gone. All of a sudden we have one of the Shimadas eliminated. Genji is dashing out with an X strike as they were trying to make it a double kill. So now it's 9 kills to 8 and both teams will soon go for level 20. Structurally, the guy and Banger are far ahead here. But in experience, the Raiders are catching up. They're going to get the level 20. And of course, in addition to that, we're also in the middle of the map seeing some damage done down at the bottom. It is the fort that falls with this man now getting the wind strider. And since they just killed Hanzo, they have now a chance to use that 5 versus 4 advantage to go for the bottom boss and take that one on. So things are looking a little bit better now for the Raiders. But it is an insane game. I mean, we are talking back and forth pretty much from minute one. And while they take their boss down at the bottom of the map, you can see the same thing happening topside. So the exact same thing is happening here as we speak. Job well done by the guy in Benga. They're at least able to trade because this rotation is not going to arrive there in time. Rega went for the pit fighter, by the way. <laughs> Rega with the pit fighter. So definitely a bit of a different approach from him. No second ancestral that they can expect during these fights. We got the rewind for Muradin and for Muradin. So both of them. Uh, and Uberak and Muradin, so yeah, both of them are going, both of the main tanks are going for it. Boss at the bottom of the map, still doing a bit of damage, they're trying to go for Muradin here, who's popping all of his cooldowns, but he's also getting absolutely murdered by these CC skills, and that is the end of the main tank. So, yeah, after the game flipped now, how many times? Three, four, five? We again! have the Raiders in the driver's seat. <laughs> they run another 5 versus 4. The boss is doing damage down at the bottom of the map. Top side is going to be defended. Sven is dealing with it. But yeah, this is fairly interesting here. If they can keep it up with these staggered deaths, that would be great. Slight advantage on the objective. Considering that we are 17 minutes in, maybe they should try and push this a little bit harder, particularly since the boss is still at the bottom of the map. Arrow misses! Nicely dodged by everybody on the blue team. Bottom keep has taken damage but hasn't fallen. And in 19 seconds, gonna be a 5 versus 5 again. So they're trying to make this time window count as they're pushing in again. The advantage, obviously, for Adigal and Benga is this fountain in the middle, thanks to the fort not being destroyed previously. But the Raiders, they are attempting to get the objective now, and so they should. I mean, they really need to try and use this time window. And another kill! Genji is there just as Muradin is back! These staggered deaths is something that the red team just cannot... I, honestly, they, they cannot deal with this. They need to somehow get five back on the map and instead they're just losing heroes over and over again. They want to protect the objective, which is fairly understandable considering that we're 18 minutes in now. But this is another one of these examples where they're just overdoing it a little bit in their attempt to slow the blue team down. The Genji steps out a bit too much. The CC train hits him hard. And here comes, finally, finally, gotta say, the first set of cavalry for the blue team.
Or at least that's what we should see, because it's not there yet. It's another 10 seconds that they can play around. Hanzo has his arrow back too, so something uh, to mention here, if he can get a good one set up. Samura's currently down at the bottom of the map, 4 seconds remaining. Genji down for another 14. Things are looking good, and there it is. The cavalry is in the house. Now, there are some pretty fancy waves that are pushing through the top in the bot lane. There's a ton of experience. Those are all double, triple waves that we're seeing there right now. So those can be taken out, particularly, of course, once that Sven is moving in with his Blade Storm 2, if he feels the need for it. But the cavalry is now coming through. And this could make things really dicey for the red team. There's no doubt that the fort in the middle is going to be destroyed. Question is, what's going to happen with all those keeps? That's where they can not only start to gain a lot more map control, but also draw even. Now it's actually a 5 versus 5. Well, the attack keeps coming. Okay. And, well, that is already the Kun busted. Arrow is out. A lot of cooldowns used in those first few seconds of the battle. Top and bottom of the map are still being pressured by cavalry, and the blue team is focusing most of their attention to the mid lane, taking that fort down and can now start to rotate. Samura is on his way towards the top to try and uh, pull this off very quickly with the raiders already diving through with the blade storm. They're getting the wall destroyed, but can they do more? And it doesn't really seem like it, especially not since they're now losing Tracer. Again, the guy and Banger darting in with 20 minutes into this game, and things are just looking absolutely juicy. Topside keep has taken damage, but should be defended. And boy, oh boy, with the Nubarak now dying, this is starting to become a really big issue for the Raiders because now we're not talking about just a good defense anymore. They're likely going to lose that second keep, and this could be where the game ends. So the guy and Banger bringing up all of the momentum again by locking in a few kills. It's now 11 kills to 10. What a game! What a series, honestly. Game number one, total blowout. The Raiders playing out of their minds there and destroying the opponent's team. Team. Now in game number two, we're having the blue team in real trouble as the guy and banger are looking to tie the series, to tie the best of five, to tie this grand final. They're going for the keep at the top, taking all of it out, make sure that there's not a single armor shield left. And this is usually a death sentence when you're play, playing on Alderic Pass. Nicely done. Fantastic performance here. Great game, great map. 11 kills to 11 with 21 minutes in. And with 7 seconds for Nubarak and 40 for Junkrat. This is going to be all she wrote. X-Ray dies once more, but it doesn't matter. The core falls. And that is victory for the Guy and Banger in game number 2 as they tie the best of 5. Game number three. Once again, we're tied and we are on Sky Temple. After initially it was the Raiders that claimed victory on the first map. The guy and Banger, they brought it back. And now we are on Sky Temple and on the left we have Sven on Blaze. We got Hunter Orc on Brightwing, Banana H on Greymane, Uki on Garrosh and Gavlo is playing Hogger. To the right side of the map, the guy and Banger with Hazops and Sylvanas, Ultralisk on Genji. We have Dark Morgan De Haka, so we get some globals in this game too. Death Knight on Anubarak and X-Ray this time on Karazim. Pretty aggressive dive combination that they're running here, particularly with Karazim as the support going into the Iron Fists for level 1, of course. But yeah, this is going to be an interesting one, particularly since we also have Garrosh on the other side, so a nice flip into a stun from uh, Blaze could lead to quick kills here if they can pull this one off. But every time... Oh, 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 talking about quick kills. <laughs> there it is again. Third game in a row that the blue team walks away with a quick kill. And now that we're in the third game, I've been thinking about it a little bit. And, uh, when I talked the sto story earlier, that highway story, I was like, I think I, ex I talked about this already. And yeah, now I remember that when I came back from Germany, the day after, I actually casted a couple of games and talked about it in those games already. And that was the day before I got sick. So that's why I slipped my mind a little bit. But yeah, now more or less back to business. Still a couple. The throat a little bit. Don't know if you can hear in my voice or not, but good enough to bring finally some more coverage of not only Heroes Lounge, but of course also the Raven Court, which we're gonna get. Uki nearly dying, but he gets saved and is able to walk away here. 
What I'm really curious about is two things on uh, the red team side. Now, first of all, the Haka, I mentioned it already a bit. You have the global factor playing in for the red team. But also, we have Sylvanas again played by Hazu. And he has done a fantastic job in previous games to just control side lanes extremely well with Sylvanas and capitalize on kills that they get in the middle and the late game. So Hazu on Sylvanas is always a bit of a threat. Even if your team gets ahead, he is the one that can then very easily negate those advantages by playing on the side lane, taking a couple of structures down, push these lanes out, and also punish you whenever you are losing a team fight and uh, all of a sudden have a numbers disadvantage. Now, all of this obviously a little bit early. We're still in the best of five, so we are going to get at least one more game after this, but it's still interesting to see who is taking the lead in this one. Bit of a flip and Ultralisk is zipping out. Now, they had a great job in game number two. Genji, all, all kind of mobility heroes are definitely fantastic for Ultralisk. I mean, he's been proving it on so many. We've seen him with Carrigan and all of the stuns, the jumps that he's coming through with, with Genji and so many others. So it's going to be great to see his uh, Genji performance once more in this game and see if he can just pat those stats, nibble on the edges, always try to get some damage in and prep potential kills for the rest of the team. First objective about to be up now. We get on level 1, Indomitable for Garrosh, and down at the bottom of the map, Sven is starting to burn this down. It's always a little bit reminiscent in the days of old where the hit points of forts were, sorry, hit points of fountains weren't tied to the forts. Back then you really wanted to take that wall down and teams would go to a lot of trouble to either try and make it happen or to prevent it from happening to them so that they can already prepare for objective number two when the bot lane temple would be the only one spawning on the map. Nowadays, a little bit different. Personally, I really like the change. I really think it's good. Particularly Genji could snipe these fountains way too easily. They could have either increased the hit points a little bit or just done what they did. Tie it to the fountain, uh, to the to the fort, so yeah. Not too bad, but it changes the dynamic a bit on the bot lane and makes it less important with these earlier pushes so that you can set yourself up for objective number two. But we have temples up and currently there is an even spread in shots. We have level seven kicking in a little bit earlier for the Raiders, which actually is fairly interesting considering that one team is running in global and the other one doesn't. Still early in the game and that kill obviously accounts for something here. And talking about kills, they're looking at another one. They want to go for Death Knight and yep, without that stun that he just burst out there, that could have become a problem. Oh, they're committing to the fight. Dartmo comes in, wants the lick and doesn't get it and now the red team is a bit low but Ultralisk is here, Blaze isn't. You don't want to fight a 5 versus 4. But of course, all of this comes at a cost. It allows Blaze for a lot of leeway down to uh, the bot lane, and he can now take the gate down and maybe also destroy another tower. That's the cost of them moving the Haka towards the top, which isn't a problem if they get a kill, but they didn't. So now they are losing some ground here at the bot lane as a result. Also noteworthy that top side we have... I mean, Hogger is going to take that fort down. That fort is way too low. As this plays out in the middle and the red team is looking for a kill, Hogger is now making his move in. Gaflo easily takes this on. The fort destroyed and therefore structurally already a small advantage for the Raiders. Not only did they destroy a fort, but they also destroyed the wall in the middle. Over here, you can see that mainly the mid lane has suffered damages on the blue team side. But those are small early game advantages that you obviously can build on that one level advantage for the Raiders falls into that category too, but it is something that you can claw your way back to very quickly. Nah, this on the other hand is exactly what I talked about earlier, these quick and dirty kills that you can get with Garrosh and Blaze, and that was very well played. I mean, this was textbook what we just saw from them, and a very quick kill against the Nubaru. We're actually going to take another look at that. Because as I mentioned, I mean, this is a textbook performance with that flip. So here, here comes flip, stun into a jet propulsion, and then a Nubarak just gets deleted. So that's the second kill for the blue team, and therefore results in level 10 kicking in early. We get a shockwave for them. Focus is on camps, as the next objective isn't up there yet. But still, very well played. Now, Festering Wounds also in now as a level 7 talent, obviously. We have Beatles on 1 and 7 for Nubarak. 
Death Knight with the Cocoon here can have a big impact for them, but it is the objective and the Siege Giants at the bottom of the map that we have to look for first. And that fort has already taken some damage. So Sylvanas and Dehaka are both up at the top, but down here it's a fort that will fall very, very quickly, particularly since every hero is, of course, showing on the map for the red team. They're trying to get level 10, which they now have, but that also means that there was absolutely no risk to the blue team to simply move in and take that fort down to get even more out of those temple shots. So the fort is destroyed, and now it's the mid lane that's under attack. But they need to also rotate somebody over towards the top, because Hazorps is now doing exactly what I mentioned earlier with the Haka. They are just punishing them for not being on that lane. Gavlo is the one trying to defend it, but he's alone. He's all alone here. So they're likely going to lose that fort. Brightwing is now moving in to try and help out. Yeah, Shockwave is missing. Greymane gets in the meantime killed in the middle of the map. So this is a little bit unlucky what's happening here. At least the entire temple has been taken. But they're trading forts. Middle of the map, another one could have been destroyed but wasn't. And this is still a big push at the bot lane but only one Siege Giants could do some damage to structures potentially if the next minion wave arrives in time. But the Harka is already on his way to shut exactly that down. So, bit arguable if they should have played this differently. Either defended the top lane a bit more aggressively or just abandoned it fully and instead push somewhere else. Counter push and yeah, be done with that. The lead is of course still there. Structurally, it's pretty much one and a half forts to uh, zero, what we're seeing. I'm really not counting those few hit points. Any attack that is now coming from the Raiders will drop this one. Seven-sided strike, obviously, as the level seven talent. No shocker here either. Level 12 and a half. Still a bit of a window where they can play around an advantage, but maybe not enough to uh, go for, let's say, a boss or something. That fort, though, has been destroyed. So the fort's gone. At the top, Sylvanas still pushing. And down here, it's more about the camps. Are oh, they? No. All right. Yeah, Ultralisk is checking. X-Strike. No, I mean, seriously, he takes z no risk with this. He's just like, yeah, I'm immediately heading out here. But again, Sylvanas is at the top, gets a few hits in, escorts the camp in. And as they're trying to chase her down, uh, the camp does damage. Hazops, this time he gets caught, but Hogger does too. So Hazops is gone, but down here Hogger was caught and the Siege Giants were taken and now they're going for the boss. So, still worth it. If Hazorps does die and they don't get Hogger, then it's maybe a bit of a different story, but the situation as is is still playing the cards of the guy in Banger. They are the ones starting to call the shots, they are the ones being aggressive, they are forcing the hand of the blue team, so they are playing a much more active style now, whereas the Raiders are becoming more reactionary by the minute, just reacting to the Sylvanas pushes and to whatever else is being thrown on the map. So the catch-up game is working quite nicely for the red team. Now they still have quite a bit to go before they can find themselves in the same spot, at least structurally speaking, but with the double temple control now, they might arrive there a bit sooner than expected. This fort down at the bottom of the map is 100% going to fall. So now it's just the temple shots that we have at the remaining temple bot side that will set the raiders ahead here. And that's damage done down at the bottom of the map where they're now taking the wall out, but already Genji is pushing through the middle. So they're just trying to out macro them. And the blue team is trying to go for camps here. I was actually thinking that they might try and sneak the boss, and that's exactly what they're doing now, as Dehaka is still at the top. And the more important part is Genji and Sylvanas are also both topside. The problem is, while this happens, the keep is going to fall. So yes, they go for the boss, which is not a dumb idea, and they're going to get that boss. That boss might lead to the keep at the bot lane getting destroyed, but they're losing the one at the top. So the guy and Banger are just running around them. They're literally just outplaying them on macro. Just running circles around them right now and trying to force them to react. The boss is taken. Now the blue team has to take the bottom keep out to just draw even, which they should easily be able to do. So they might try and go for core here, which is why the red team is pushing. They want to force them back so that they can either go for core themselves or retreat and save their own. And it's going to be a race. And I can tell you with the Haka preventing some of the halfbacks down at the bottom of the map, this is looking like a really easy victory for the guy and Banger. Out played and outmatched 
a 2-1 lead for the red team as they're running circles around the Raiders in game number three. Well done, GG. Okay, game number four. We got a 2-1 lead for the Geilen Banger, winning two in a row. And Sky Temple was pretty sexy, honestly. Very nicely done by the red team, playing around the uh, opponent's lineup and using the two tools that are highlighted at the beginning of Sky Temple, using Sylvanas and the Haka to really run circles around the Raiders. Now, we are on Vault Sky. I haven't seen that map in a hot minute. Uki on Garrosh, Banana H on Hanzo, Sven on Blaze. We got Hunter Org on Lucio and... And we have Gavlo playing Zarya. So a Garrosh Zarya combination for the blue team. And on the right side, Hazorps with Sergeant Hammer X ray on Brightwing, Darkmoke on Leoric. We get Death Knight on Diablo, and Ultralisk is playing Li Ming. Really nice setup for the blue team in the sense that they have that obviously notorious combo with Zarya and uh, Garrosh. On level 4, we're going to see that kick in with the speed barrier for Zarya. But that yeah, should be interesting to see what they can pull off here against the Sergeant Hammer combination of the German team. Usually uh, trying to make sure that you don't give the Panzer to the Germans. But in this case, maybe a bit of a different story. We get Li Ming with that for potential resets. And already, Death Knight gets attacked here. Now, I mentioned it already previously. We had now three games in a row where the blue team locked in an early kill. And maybe they can do the same thing again. It would be kind of funny if they are always the ones walking away with first blood here. Now, advanced artillery on level one. We get Leo with the Austin's Renewal. Of course, here on Volskaya, it's all about zone control. And Sergeant Hammer excels at that. So, uh, this is going to probably be it. But either way, Sven... Now up at the top against Hazorps and down to the bottom of the map. They want to go for first blood this time apparently. It was actually a nice move by Ultralis. So he had the combo exactly where Diablo would have pushed uh, Hanzo if he could have gotten a hold of him, which wasn't the case here. But that could have indeed been first blood for them if this connects. Now you want to get your items obviously early. In this case, both of them make a play for the turret instead of going for uh, the healing beacon up at the top. And now on the left side, yeah, they can't invade this, so both of them are taking this one quickly, more or less as quickly as they can. But Darkmork in the middle, the green giant over here, yeah, more of a nice giant fan here when it comes to uh, the uh, to the tint. But the skin is nice. I like the I like the skin. This is also one of the skins where I let the money pick slide every now and then. You can go for the blue carpet and also the blue tint, and all of a sudden you have an ice giant. But he sinks it up with a with a green money pick. All right, I'll take everything back. Go green, my friend. Go green. I like it. Yeah, going full hot mode over here. Apparently, love it. Talking about going ham, Ultralisk, <laughs> Ultra Dodgy, getting out of everybody's grass. That could have been first blood, but he had the cooldown to save himself. But it was close. Now we get the speed barrier, and this is where, of course, Garrosh gets real fun because Zarya is going to put the bubble on Garrosh. Garrosh can run into the opponent's team, chase down pretty much everyone, and then get a flip there. It doesn't need that pleb horse anymore. So, yeah. He gets definitely some... Uh, this is... No no points. No points for, for Uki here. Pleb horse, really? Nah. Can't let that slide. So, we have to mention it at least once. Needs to get a different mount here at some point. Make it something epic, something unique, something rare. I'm sure he has something like that. But the camp gets taken. So, this is actually kind of important because for the first objective, it simply means that they are running the healing beacon. You want to get the early level 7 if you can. Brightwing is about to claim an advantage on uh, the first checkpoint. But there's also pressure applied at the bottom of the map. Where the red team is now all of a sudden doing some solid work here. I mean, not only do we have both of the towers destroyed, but the gate is down too. So you have full vision. Nobody can really hide here. Total numbers advantage that they are pulling on Blaze. And there's level 7, which gives them even more of a lead. And let's not forget, it also finally allows Hazorps on Sergeant Hammer to uh, gain a bit more mobility that he can use to control the space around the checkpoint. So, gonna look good for them. 
Only a little four dark mock though, not looking good for him. Now Leo is obviously going to be back very, very quickly, so not the worst thing to uh, potentially happen for them here, but definitely also not a positive to note. Still at the top, Sergeant Hammer hasn't joined the fun yet, is instead trying to go for the wall. We have 29% for the guy in Banger. And another kill! Trashwing is down! So the Fruit Fly gets killed in the middle and that allows for more control for the Raiders. They are losing structures at the top, but at least they're picking up an advantage on objective number one and could look for the first protector here. So... We'll see how that plays out, but at least for now they're at 50% and they're gonna get more. Brightwing can of course reappear. Two lanes have been pressured previously by the red team as Ultralisk is going for this. Lucio also fairly interesting as a pick because he can allow you to just roam these lanes so much faster. And I love how Hunter Orc is now really applying the screws on Ultralisk. He might have been able to get the kill here, but instead he now gets murdered. So he didn't see that rotation coming, but I like that he nearly soloed Li Ming. That was pretty cool. So seeing Lucio in a game is always interesting since most of the time he just gets banned out. This is also a map where he can give you a lot of advantages. But now Death Knight gets killed. So they are trading some blows and it is the first protector for the Raiders. Now of course back in the days it was all about the top lane. You're always trying to get as much top lane value as possible so that you could prepare for the second objective, second checkpoint at the top now has shifted a little bit. Ever since the uh, hit points of the fountains gets tied to the forts, doesn't really matter all that much anymore, so they can now pressure through the middle instead. We have them with an early level 10, the high 5 is in, the expulsion zone. The guy and Benga are just shortly behind, so it's not big gap or anything between the two teams here. But it's a decent start for the Raiders now. Three kills to one, bit of an advantage on this as well. Uh, Li Ming gets away once again. That would have, of course, have been pretty stellar if they could have moved in here and uh, gotten a kill on that too. Wasn't quite the case, but yeah. So we get six minutes in. A push that is still going on for a few more seconds. Mid lane has been opened up a bit. First protector is usually not doing all that much, so let's keep that in mind. But they were at least able to do some damage. Now, with that said and done, we are still having uh, some aggression in the middle of the map as they're trying to uh, get maybe an invade going at the next item camp. And yes, this is not looking too bad. They're coming in here, stealing it away, or at least trying to. Sergeant Hammer is doing the best that they can, but what an expulsion zone here by Zarya that leads to a kill against Hazorbs. Fourth kill in total will be picked up by the Raiders and they want to go for Diablo to make it five and they succeed. Nice. So, they took him down, and that is now a half-level lead. Really nice position on the map, and should at least help them to take that bot wall down. Leo has already moved to the top, and was of course hoping to get some damage in on the fort, but, well, with Sven being here, that's very unlikely to happen, so he's going to grab the experience. Another nice move at the bottom of the map against Brightwing! Hanzo with a short distance arrow, and able to get that stun in. Brightwing nearly escaping, but then it's Zarya who comes through and drops it. Pinpoint accuracy indeed. Gets the kill. Brightwing down for another 10 seconds and that means more and more damage on the bottom fort. They're not gonna get the entire thing, but that was still a nice move. Garrosh gets attacked, he doesn't care, just throws him back out. But I like the into Oh, Ultralisk! Nice idea here, yeah, but he didn't get the combo connected and instead he gets Hanzo'd! Ultralisk gets Hanzo'd super quickly here. Oh, that, and maybe another Diablo kill? He is fully stacked now, so yes, Diablo is gone. He will be back in a few more seconds, but he lost his stacks. But let's check out, just check out Liming in this one. So first they get this little combo going, Zarya dies, and then BAM! <laughs> Hanzo just shuts down Ultralisk. Li Ming falls, eight kills to two now. And still an entire level advantage. Ultral is going for... Oh, going for Glass Cannon. I mean, considering how he just got popped a second ago by Hanzo, we would double check on that pick. But yeah, has apparently a lot of trust in his abilities to dodge out on all of those damage shots that can be fired here. 17, 
thousand damage so far for Ultralis. Only one death was the only time that he died. We have 22,000 for Zarya, 31,000 for Hanzo. And here they come again. Looking for maybe Diablo. Yeah, Uki got a bit outplayed here. Nice dodge on the arrow. Whew. Good moves and good awareness from Death Knight. If he does not, if he catches that arrow, then very likely uh, Garrosh gets another shot at him. But we have at the top still the checkpoint. Hasn't really been triggered yet. They're now at 15 to 14, so the one level lead is still there. And well, let's see what we're gonna get with this. There's the move, they're coming in again, trying to push them out. A bit of a flip on Brightwing, and that's a kill. Nine kills to two, and Diablo still doing some work here to zone them out with the lightning breath. I mean, it's a little bit of a back and forth that we have between the two of them. So far, the noteworthy part is that we got several kills also for the blue team, and they still run that one level advantage, which results in 16 as a lead. Now that they're moving in here, they could also try and steal this camp away, because they will rely on that level advantage and talent advantage in a second, and there it is. So that's an opportunity to not only take the fort down, but also go and drop the uh, the camp and claim the item so yeah. if they can get a kill here that would be great worst case scenario of course they lose one of their heroes but it's a four versus four Garrosh low ultra has been a lot of damage has not become the target yet but Diablo is gone and it's actually hunter orc with Lucio that several times has now moved in and nibbled away at ultra list sit point pool with Hanzo trying to get a good shot lined up too the fort falls I guess that was I mean, again, unless they get a kill against the blue team, it was inevitable. Now they have to give up the camp too, so item control is in the hands of the raiders. And they are just generally taking advantage of these small leads that they have. With talents and therefore stats, with the, uh, the levels as well. So, yeah, it's looking pretty good for them. They can also go for the second objective if they want, but as so often on Volskaya Foundry, the objective is a little bit secondary. You're just trying to get advantages elsewhere, trying to go for the items, trying to go for structures as you can take them out, and the objective doesn't get prioritized too much. I mean, we're now 11 minutes in, the, the B point has been active for minutes, and nobody has given a shit. So, yeah, Volskaya Foundry, it's just a typical Volskaya Foundry game. We got on 16 the Mithril Maze, we also got Mirror Ball and Giant Killer. And with Giant Killer, things could change a bit. There are some pretty hit point heavy heroes on the side of the Raiders. They have a fairly beefy wall. Sven here, forced to bunker it up. Gets immediately also... Oh, 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 and he dies! Yeah, that got a bit unlucky there. Well done, particularly by Ultralist. That combo that came out, he didn't think he would eat that too. So Blaze eats all of that, tries to escape, and then it's Diablo that burns him down. Well done, and the third kill of 40 guy and Banger. So they're attempting to bring this back once more. So far, it is... I, again, Game 3 was super entertaining. Game 2 in particular was an endless back and forth, and it seems that Volskaya Foundry is going to be a very similar map at least in regards to how the game unfolds. So the red team is attempting to catch up again, and that includes Leo at the top taking out some minion waves and trying to obliterate a fort here. I mean, technically, both teams are structurally even. So each team has taken out one fort. Still nobody caring about the objective, I might add. It's all about dealing with Sergeant Hammer, dealing with everyone else. But there is that item advantage for the Raiders that still is maintained by the blue team. They still got that. And of course they have the one level lead. So once level 20 hits, there will be a window where they can be aggressive. And where the red team will have to fall back. But besides that, we haven't progressed too far through this game. Another flip, another taunt. They're uh, getting another jet propulsion in, but there's just simply not enough damage ready yet to follow up on this. Healing Beacon is out as they're expecting a bit attack once that Leo drops the Entomb, which never really came. So they're using the item. Maybe a little bit premature. Hindsight always being 20-20, they could have saved it. 
but I think it also played a part in uh, the guy in Banger backing off from that battle because they didn't want to fight into the sustain in this situation. So, yeah, down to the bottom of the map, we now got Darkmog again doing his thing, just controlling the side lanes, controlling the experience, trying to bring them back here towards level 20. And finally the blue team making a few moves here, taking the fort out in the middle. Arrow is out, glass cannon, goodbye Leeming. Dodged the arrow, but it wasn't enough, can't dodge the damage, so she's down. And that means that the Raiders not only inch a bit farther towards level 20, but also have a big opportunity here now in the middle as they're trying to go for some follow up kills. It's a 5 versus 4 after all. Uki looking to get another hold of them, but can not. So, with an advantage, there is a fort at the top that they could try to bully, or they could also still go for the objective if they value it in any way, shape, or form technically try and do both things at the same time but again nobody cares <laughs> protector no thank you so the cam we're thinking about stealing it but the red team was faster i like it good decision to move on to it immediately bit of a risk of course as well but it paid off for them now there's level 20 oh and Hazo. Hazo nearly getting unzoed, stunned by the bullseye instantly and then the combo hit but it wasn't enough damage to drop sergeant hammer we now got the Grenadier in on level 20. We also got Bullseye. We already saw it in action, the fortified bunker. And here they come trying to barrel through the top. BFG already used. Liming, of course, with Glass Cannon can still easily one-shot somebody if she gets a hold of Banana H, which hasn't happened so far. Leo with the Entomb. Diablo goes down, though. They're fighting into level 20 here, and the Storm Talents definitely giving the Raiders an advantage, but Ultralisk with good positioning, poking them down slowly, steadily. Dibbles back, losing his souls, or most of them, but they force them back Make sure that the top keep does not get destroyed. And now they themselves are about to hit level 20 talents. So there is indeed an advantage for the Raiders. They want to force game number 5, obviously. I mean, they want, don't want to give up here. This is the best of 5 series. It's a 2-1 lead for the Guy and Banger. And it's all about can they force the third game of this series. Or are they going to lose the entire thing here. Take second place and let the red team walk away with the overall victory. That's the big question right now. Now, as is, we're looking at 12 kills to 3. Still a big advantage, but honestly the kill count doesn't matter anymore after you hit level 20. Nobody cares about kills and the experience lead that comes with it. Now, first of all, as obviously some experience has been made up. Oh, Leo. Yeah, Leo going down here. Look at the hero experience. Big gap. 7,000 XP gap between the two. But there's also a Pretty big gap in minion experience where the guy in Banger have done this stellar job to just soak more of the lanes. Uh, forced away from the camp again. I mean, I like it. I honestly like that they were trying to claim it. I love that Hanzo had the arrow ready for it and they decided to fall back and not fight this out since Leo can only provide vision but not actively take part of the fight. But now here comes Li Ming again. The problem is that Diablo is just putting himself into a real bad spot as he uses his ult. Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten out of this, but after Leo fell and they gave the camp up, they should have probably just fallen back here cut their losses, wait for Leoric to come back. Now they have 50 seconds until Diablo is back in the game. And at the top, the keep is already exposed. So the blue team is going for a two-pronged attack. They have the camp's top side. They're pushing with everybody else down at the bottom of the map. Still have to deal with Liming. And Ultralisk, yes, I mean, Glass Cannon is a little bit of a meme and you can get easily sniped, but Ultralisk has only died a single time after he picked the talent. And he might not have top damage in the game, but he's the one that is consistently threatening to get kills so it's definitely a worthwhile talent for them if he dies at some point this could very quickly change but right now he is keeping the entire blue team at bay and making it very very costly for them to push into this they are still opening up those walls the top keep has taken damage down here at the bottom of the map as you can tell the bottom keep is also getting some hit points removed yeah another hit is coming at the top 17 minutes in now on this one but yep, it's an interesting one, to say the least. So, as is, we now have 18 minutes on the clock, 22 to 21. 18 points have taken, been taken earlier on the checkpoint, but again, nobody cares about the objective. Keep in mind, we are 18 minutes in, we have only seen a single protector. Only one. Nobody cared about anything else. With that, we have 
straight up at the top. Another push happening. Gavlo, he's they need to deal with the camp here still. But this will likely, I mean, the, the next big fight could be the last. So yeah, very likely it's going to play a, a, play a big role here. Huge damage numbers, obviously, on Siege for both side laners. 167,000, 161,000. Blaze and Leo have been busy. 81,000 for Hanzo. Talking about being busy. Hanzo has done a great job in this game, too. Now, there's still a protector. Oh, sorry, the, um, uh, the uh, thingy was still up. And they grabbed it. So Sven has it now. Has the healing beacon. Yeah, Leo is looking for... I mean, he used this tomb a moment ago, so he can't lock him down again. But they are coming through with this once more. Another drain applied. Sven needs to go back here. Dodges the combo. Well done. Ultralisk. Not quite able to connect it, but still padding his damage against particularly Zarya. And Sergeant Hammer, so much is hinging on Hazorbs. The two of them are chipping away at the hit point pool of the blue team, but the advantage in items still goes to the Raiders. I mean, they're fighting tooth and nail. Obviously, they want game five, so they gotta bring everything here. They gotta bring their A game on this map if they wanna have a chance. Initially, they won the first map, but then lost two in a row. Particularly, Sky Temple was super interesting. But in this case now, here comes Diablo with the Hellgate. They're forcing it. The Entomb is there. Good shields from Zarya. And Hanzo and Zarya taking them down. Brightwing Diablo and Leoric all eliminated. Job well done. Now they go for Liming. She's dead too. That's three kills. And they're about to chase down Sergeant Hammer. The hammer gets killed, but boy, oh boy, that fight over the camp. Full five-man team wipe with Hanzo and Zarya just excelling in that last encounter. Now the top keep gets attacked, and I guess we're getting game number five. Looking quite good for us. Game five, inevitable at, at this point. Well done. They're coming in here 20 minutes in. 19 to 3 kills. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of game number four between these two teams at the grand final of Division One of Heroes Lounge. Really nice performance again by the Raiders and an absolutely nail biter of a series as we are headed for the final map in this best of five GG. Game number five, the final map. Here we are, everybody. It is time to crown a champion. We got the Raiders going up against the Geilen Bengan. We are on Infernal Shrines, our final map. Left side, we got Banana H on Brightwing. We got Sven on Hogger, Duki on Murder, and Gavlo on Chromi, and Vito Q on Sylvanas. It's gonna be a mage battle, because on the right side of the map, look at Ultralisk. Not a hero that we see a lot from him, it is Kalthas. Chromio against Kalthas, the big battle here. They're not quite singing a song of ice and fire here. For that, we need a Jaina, but a sand against fire is, I guess, a decent substitute. We have Death Knight playing Jojo, x ray on Deckard Kane, Dark on Blaze, and Hazorps again on Hanzo. And everybody still remembers the game where Hanzo absolutely destroyed the blue team in the hands of Hazorps. So, level 1, of course, it's the Mana Addict. As usual, for Chromie, we get the Time Walker Pursuit. And, oof, even the game, the Blizzard servers are having some trouble with the tension that is in the air between those two teams. And damn, for a second I was afraid that they're shutting the servers down all, uh, right now, but apparently we're still Gucci for another couple of weeks and months. Yeah, we're not, we're not gonna pull it in China here. They turned the Chinese servers off, but that was more about politics than anything else. And obviously, the Chinese players still have access to the Asian server. When did it happen? Half a year ago? Something along those lines. But yeah, either way, we now have at the top our one-on-one -on -one established with Dark Mog against uh, Sven. And Sylvanas is coming in to say hello real quickly. This is, I believe, the first time that the blue team is playing Sylvanas in this grand final. So now they have an opportunity here to uh, try and give the Geilenbanger 
a taste of their own medicine. Sylvanas was played multiple times by Hazu. But it's really interesting that we're now in this fifth uh, map. And it's honestly awesome. As I said, I believe in game number one or game number two. I didn't really expect the Raiders to give such a showing as they currently do here. And I absolutely love it. I think it's great that we're going to the final map. We're going full distance. And immediate aggression here from the Guilin Banger as they're coming in to steal the opponent's camp away. Muradin, quick stumble by him. Has to be a bit careful, uh, so it gets poked, but not anything dangerous just yet. Now, bot lane control comes at a price, and the camp that they just took, and that means that at the top, Sylvanas and Hogger had a bit more freedom than they usually would enjoy, and were able to take part of that wall down, or at least damage it significantly. And here we go. So. Already we're having uh, a nice hit coming in on Azu, and it is again first blood for the blue team. Quick attack also on Silvana. She's there too, so they're trading blows as they have done all game long. All series long, this is what we saw here, but this time it is the red team that gets the upper hand and walks away with a kill advantage. Two kills to one against the, the Raiders as the first objective gets announced yeah, and up at the top we are now looking at a Hogger doing his thing on the camp same done over on the right side by the way we have Kelsos with a really nice progress on his stacks I mean normally what you're trying to do with the mana addict is you want to get to a full stack count around level 10 just so that when the heroic abilities kick in you can rely on the extra shield you're obviously gonna stack it then afterwards even further but that's kind of the time frame that you're in an ideal world looking for and he's already sitting at 11 so really nice job by Ultralisk here being very diligent about it if they are able to get the Punisher then they also get the extra globes here that would really accept accelerate his progress but of course first they gotta win this one because the Raiders they're bringing everything they have small advantage in experience for the guy in Banger so they're gonna get the early level 7 and well we'll see we have the talent kicking in Sven still trying to get a few hits jet propulsion missing that's always annoying so dark not hitting the target there and they can bring that back a little bit more ding 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 dong 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 played by Hogger Sven is doing his best to try and ping pong around them here. Spin to win, baby, but they have to yield the uh, yeah, they have to yield the area. I have to retreat. The shrine falls into the hands of the guy in Banger. And here comes Ultralisk with a few more globes. And he's sitting at 50 now. They're still chasing Sylvanas down. Might be able to get her now too. Ooh boy! <laughs> Cutting it close. But escaping nonetheless. Middle of the map, the bait over the wall has happened, making it a bit easier to take the Punisher down. Both teams on level 7. But they're definitely fighting tooth and nail for every little advantage in this fifth game now. Everybody wants to claim the season's champion title. Down to the bot lane. Already some mini waves taken out to uh, catch up in experience. Top side, obviously, we talked about it previously. This wall was already heavily damaged thanks to Sylvanas and Hogger pushing. So no problem for the camp to destroy all those structures. Whereas down here, another camp is now on the menu. In this case, for the Raiders. So they walk away with the Kazura camp. 18 stacks for Kelthas. So he's getting closer there. And, well, here we are. We have still the focus on the bottom of the map, but seems like Ultralisk is... Ah, man on a mission. I love Kleltha's being played because he just adds that extra oomph that comes with the gravity laps and is trying it here again. Sven was still hoping for a kill against Darkmook and now Brightwing is moving in to help out too, so Darkmook could fall. But Banana H doesn't get into range, so Darkmok escapes with Blaze. They're still fighting it out at the bottom with them and are using Chromie to poke from a distance. But Kelthas can make a big difference as the game continues. His weakness was always the lack of mobility and that as mobility creep was entering the game heavily, he fell victim to the Genjis, the Tracers and whatnot. But beforehand, his extra stun came in quite handy for a lot of plays. And we saw one combo right here. Gravity Labs, Jet Propulsion working together, nailing the target down. You imagine a few more heroes around and then all of a sudden you're looking at a quick kill. So in big team fights, that is a huge possibility. On top of that, the AoE that you bring 
to the table on the shrine any kind of objective that works around space uh, or around a very defined narrow space can be really good so we get the little nado lonado on uh, level 10 and Muradin still making his choice but it is no playmaker game it is indeed another avatar and with that He's already starting to join the battle by jumping in, being a bit aggressive here. Can always rely on his panic button, as he does right now. They are looking at Dark Mog, trying to force him to pop the bunker. Hasn't happened so far, but the Stormbolt connected. And maybe he will have to do that after all. Uh, not quite. Gotta be close there. Slowing sands for Chromie to zone on the objective even further. Now, when we're talking about the objective, the next shrine spawns at the top, so... At the bottom, there's still a camp up. Arrow only connecting with Brightwing in the back. Not really of any consequence. Uki's jumping out. Living Bomb not spread yet either. So a nice attack by the red team, but not too much that they could gain here. Bit of damage on structures is the only thing that essentially was won. But another hit is now coming in on uh, the top lane as the fort is losing some hit points. We have a f uh, camp now taken too by the guy and Banger. So it's still a very even game between the two teams. And after the initial three kills that we saw, not a single hero has died. The shrine is finally active at the top and talking about heroes dying, Hanzo gets popped. Hanzo at the bottom of the map gets caught as the teams are just getting ready to move towards the top to go for the next objective. And that is pretty shitty timing. <laughs> this is really shitty timing. So two kills to two and Hoga is already starting up on the stacks as Chromie is even pushing the lane out a bit. Mirrodin is trying to slow them down so that Hoga has more time on this. But that's a very, very good start for the Raiders into the objective and also they are closer to level 13. Not a big gap, can be impactful though. And since they're already on 23 stacks, it doesn't even seem like the guy in Bang are interested in going for the Punisher. They're realizing that it's like not gonna happen. Gravity Lapse is out. They knew that in the choke point, Ultralisk would likely be able to dodge them. So they didn't risk losing half the hit points or even more by chasing him too far. But still well done. They get an advantage here for free. They get the Frozen Punisher. And that should eliminate the top fort. Top fort should honestly be a goner. There's, I, I, there's no way to save this. Let's be honest here for just a second. And Chrome, uh, Chromie and Sylvanas being set up at the bottom of the map means that if there's too many heroes rotating top to defend, that Sylvanas can also push the bot lane out, which is exactly what they're currently doing here. So Brightwing is with her, but yes, they are going for the fort. There's already Hogger coming in, Chromie poking them out. That fort is doomed and Sylvanas is still at the bottom of the map, as she should. So they are splitting their forces. Gotta be careful up at the top. Nice arrows to follow up on uh, Jojo stun with the blessed shield. Sven still fine? No, not really. So he's gone. But again, this kill might have been a little bit too expensive for the guy in Banger. Because now they are losing half the hit points on the fort. And I think Sylvanas could have even stayed a bit longer on this one. But even without that, look at how low this thing is. So tons of structural damage now done by the Raiders. And it came at the cost of Hogger, who's back in 8 seconds. The lead in experience, that's a bit of a different question though, because the red team has now reached level 14 and a half, they're half a level ahead. And they're also trying to use this small advantage now to go for the camp, which they should get. There's a little bit of poke happening to just threaten Jojo, but essentially it's a free camp for the red team. And again, whoever wins on Infernal Shrines takes the victory in the series and crowns themselves champions. So this is what it all comes down to. Down to the bottom of the map. Muradin, the jump, the stormbolt, Chromie, yes, the damage, and Ultralisk. Oh boy, he makes it out of that fight, so kudos to him. That looked like it could have been a kill for sure. He's at 32 stacks now for the shield on level 1. Yeah, and they're going for Dartmoor, going for place. The arrow completely missing here. Hazo jumping out. Oh, and Chromie and Sylvanas get both burned down and killed by the old man. Feels a little bit creepy, honestly. I mean, getting some creeper vibes here from him, but either way, 
the boomer is gone and the experience gap between the two has just now been accelerated so all of a sudden the guy Wenger are looking at level 16 more of a level at than a level advantage and they destroy the fort this is getting dangerous for the raiders very dangerous because with level 16 talents in their hands they should be able to take another fort down with ease and this is a significant gap if they can maintain that as the game continues, we could potentially look at a bit of a snowball situation later on. Blaze isn't here, he moved towards the top to take the minion wave down in the camp, so... Oh my god. Brightwing down, that is disastrous. Again the staggered deaths here. Ultralisk is doing work. Living bombs, flame strikes, he's at 21,000. Not reaching the numbers that Hanzo is bringing with all the poke that Hazorbs can use here. But still, Ultralisk with all of that added CC and him making it extremely difficult for the blue team to coordinate because of the living bombs is becoming a massive pain in the ass for them. So, yeah, this is getting very, very dangerous for the Raiders. They played such a fantastic series. I mean, they let in this best of five with the first map that they took easily. It really seemed like the German team needed uh, a coffee or two, needed to properly wake up because they got just murdered by the Raiders. But now we have a situation in which it's a one and a half level lead that the red team enjoys. There's an objective up on the map. It's 16 versus 16 talents, so at least a fighting chance for the Raiders when we're talking about the Mortar Punisher. But they don't have a fountain anymore on that bot lane. And in the mid lane, so there is still the option for the guy in Benga to move back, tap the fountain after half the fight which doesn't exist for the Raider, so it's do or die here. You go in, you try and force the fight, you try to get your kill, and they are not getting it! Instead, they're about to lose Banana H! He makes it out and escapes, but now their support is incredibly low. Darkmog is forced to bunker up at least. 31 to 15 stacks, the arrow, the condemn, all of it working together for the red team. They're looking for a kill, they cannot find it now, but they get the Mortar Punisher. 40 stacks by now too, for Kalthas. Top side, that's where we have a big push coming on the other hand. Camp, catapult, minion wave, seems like Blaze, yes, Darkmok, he's hearthing uh, back again doing his thing there to make sure that the top keep does not get destroyed but down at the bottom of the map this is really a pain train that is slowly building up in favor of the Gylen banger the pain train is coming choo choo and Benny isn't even here so they go in take down the entire wall and work on the keep can they claim the keep? That's a big question because now it's a 5 versus 4 with Sven moving in, so it depends a bit on how willing they are to risk something. But since the Mortar Punisher is still doing damage on its own, there is a good chance that they are able to take the structure out and they should be yeah, they should be able to pull it off. But it's going to cost them they got Kane, the old man is gone. Hogger dies, so it's again a trade in kills. 3 to 7. The keep has indeed been destroyed. And now maybe another kill? Yes, the gravity laps. Perfect from Ultralisk. Perfect CC from him. Nicely done. Uki is moving back out with the Storm Bolt into the face of Kalthos to stop him from CCing him even further. But I don't think that Mirrodin is going to make it. He's going to try to jump out. Gets immediately sucked in. There's the arrow from Hanzo. Kalthos with the gravity laps. And they're getting Brightwing. Brightwing came in for an assist and got immediately killed. So bye-bye Fruitfly. Bye-bye Mirrodin. And that is now 10 kills to 3 and nearly level 20. The Gylen Banger with massive amounts of momentum. That's going to be tough to bring back. Yep, right here. Brightwing comes in. And look at that gravity lapse. It is absolutely perfect. Also from the timing here. Brightwing gets caught. Murden gets caught. Both of them die eventually. The first one to fall is the Fruit Fly. Now we got the Mornados on level 20. Bullseye is in. Fortified Bunker. Flamethrower, of course. So they have their Storm Talents. And it's a two-level gap. The next shrine will activate in the middle of the map. But this is looking extremely good for the red team. Now, of course the Raiders are still trying to hold on to this. A comeback isn't impossible here. But they need to win a team fight. And up to this point, three kills is all that they got. Two of them against Hanzo when they were able to catch Hanzo Ops. So yeah, not gonna be easy for them. 
to say the least. Now in damage we have 42,000 for Hanzo, we got 37,000 for Kel'Thas. Chromie only sitting at 34k. And even Sylvanas couldn't help him too much here. She didn't get as much value as they were hoping for. Initially, she applied pressure at the bottom fourth, and I really liked that attack when the blue team was pushing with the Punisher at the top. Had Sylvanas at the bottom and was able to apply pressure to two forts at the same time. But after that, she didn't really play a big role in the macro game for them. Now we have still a level lead for the guy in Banger. They destroyed the final fort as they should have, so good on them. And with that said, they are already poking at the walls a bit. Side wall has been opened up, so even if they're uh, now saying, okay, let's engage here, they already have vision granted, and they're just bouncing between the two lanes, poking them down slowly before the next objective gets announced. The whole idea of the Raiders is obviously to just get to level 20. Don't fight, sit tight, don't lose any more keeps, don't lose any more heroes, play for 20 and then fight for the next objective, which is likely going to be their last shot. With the mid lane wall now nearly fully taken down, this also means that there would be very little resistance if the red team is grabbing the next Punisher. And even more so, it is again that fountain. That fountain over here is a big opportunity for the red team to just simply tap during the team fight. It's also a frozen Punisher, making matters worse. And he has level 20. So just in time for the Shrine fight. I mean, this is the opportunity. This is the one moment. Now you gotta get your kills. Now you gotta make your play. This is do or die. You come in, you get your hits, you get your kills, you get the Punisher, and then you start taking some structures down. Mirrodin jumping into the back, trying to go for Hazorps, who jumps out immediately. They are moving in once again with even more damage, trying to uh, yeah zone them away. But look at the stacks, 35 to nearly zero. The AOE that we are getting from the guy in Banger is just something that the blue team cannot match here. Hogger is pogging around, he dies. Sven's gone, now Uki is jumping out. Frozen Punisher has been claimed and it is just disastrous. The Raiders, they've been fighting tooth and nail throughout this best of five. They had some incredible showings, particularly on the first map, but the Gaia and Banger, it seems like they can crown themselves champion of the season as they are moving now into the mid lane, trying to destroy another keep, trying to get another couple of kills, and of course, move for the core itself, which is the ultimate target here. Uki with another stun. Yeah, most of the ults have been used during the team fight, so Blaze doesn't have the bunker anymore, but Muradin goes down as they're using the CC again. Haas with a nice chain here, Bullseye being used. Gravity Labs after Gravity Labs fired out by Ultralisk in an attempt to get even more kills for the team. The keep is about to get destroyed, and the core already attacked. Such a great job here by the Geilenbanger. Extremely well done, and the impact of Hanzo and of Kalthas cannot be understated. So many good moves here. The added CC from Kalthas Gravity Labs was spectacular and incremental for so many kills. Another stun from Hazu. 15 kills, 16 kills, 2 3. The game is over, so is the match. Die Geilenbanger, they are the champions of the Heroes Lounge season in Division 1. Congratulations, well played.